Stone, director, two directing Oscars. That's pretty good. No one uh, directing today has more than that. Steven Spielberg and uh, a couple of others have two Oscars. No one more than that. So that's a sign of respect in the Hollywood community, if nothing else. Oliver Stone is provocative That's uh, and controversial. Those would be two key words for him. He does manage to pick uh, subjects that are uh, a little bit controversial, um, whether uh, uh, socially or politically or, or whatever, um, partly because he deals with films from around the 1960s, Vietnam and things like that, and also the media. Uh, he's also known at least for about uh, three or four or five films uh, that he made in, uh, in the early 1990s of uh, really pushing the boundaries of editing. Um, and that was taken up later on by music videos and uh, television, but he and uh, his editors, and he was really pushing his editors, so he'd, he'd say more, 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 faster, faster, uh, jump cuts, uh, multiple formats, and multiple formats means that he's not just using standard 35 millimeter color film. And uh, what we see today, uh, digital formats, resembles 35 millimeter color film quite a bit. But what he was doing uh, in the 90s was black and white film, 16 millimeter film, Super 8 film, and all of that. So uh, he's just kind of putting them all together, chopping it all up, uh, breaking all sorts of rules and everything. And we will, uh, we have some nice links to all of that uh, to get a chance to see. It's hard to describe, really, so you'll get a chance to see uh, what he's doing with, uh, with the editing. So he began as a writer, like so many directors have done, Woody Allen and uh, people like that. Uh, Coen Brothers kind of began writing, and uh, Preston Sturgis, lots of uh, directors began as writers. Some began as actors, like Clint Eastwood, people like that. Uh, Oliver Stone began as a writer, and like a lot of writers, thought he could do a better job of uh, visualizing and, and uh, filming his uh, screenplays. And eventually he got a chance. Platoon, I think it's about his third film or so, and he won the Best Picture Oscar and Directing Oscar. For that. Uh, his second uh, directing Oscar, I believe, was for Born on the Fourth of July. Uh, he also did Wall Street. Michael Douglas won the Best Acting Oscar for that, and he did The Doors. And again, I don't want to make too big of a deal about the whole Oscar thing. There are so many great movies that didn't win Oscars. Uh, it is a nice sign of respect. I'm sure every actor or director or anybody who wins an Oscar is very happy for that, but it is not the only measure of greatness that we have. Stanley Kubrick, uh, 2001, Dr. Strangelove, Clockwork Orange didn't win Oscars for any of those. Orson Welles didn't win uh, for directing or picture of Citizen Kane, and there are dozens and dozens of, of uh, examples of, of directors and actors. Cary Grant never won an Oscar. So there's lots of examples of people who didn't win Oscars. So I don't want to make too big of a deal about it, but I know that it is a good sign of respect from your peers in the Academy. So we'll, we'll sort of take it uh, as a mixture. It's, it's cool to get one, but it's not uh, the, the biggest tragedy in the world to not get one either. You're in pretty good company if you have not won an Oscar for your, in your chosen field. So uh, JFK, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to uh, focus in on that one for a little bit uh, from 1990, and it does have the multiple formats, and it has really the extreme editing, and it is provocative and controversial. JFK, the, the, those, were that, those were the initials of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, and he was assassinated in Dallas, Texas in November of 1963, and it's not really about JFK and the assassination so much as it's about the investigation into all of that 
about 10 years later. And in New Orleans, there was a district attorney. His name was Jim Garrison. District attorneys have uh, lots of uh, lawyers on their staff and investigators and detectives and all of that. And he uh, decided he wanted to look into it. A lot of the people that were part of the Kennedy assassination, Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby and people like that, had gone through New Orleans. So he thought it was something that he should be looking into. And this is one of the very first uh, great conspiracy theories that we have. There's lots of conspiracy theories going back to did we even land on the moon? Uh, uh, did some people know about the uh, attacks on 9-11? Uh, and there are lots of conspiracy theories out there, lots and lots. And this is one of the very first ones, way, going way back to the 1960s. And the key, uh, uh, the key question for a lot of theorists was how could Lee Harvey Oswald have done it alone? Uh, it required a lot of uh, planning, uh, even the shooting uh, from the book depository across the street and up high and everything, a moving target. Kennedy was in a, uh, a, a convertible traveling along, not very fast, but he was in a convertible traveling along. Uh, Oswald's gun was bolt action, which means you have to uh, manually uh, put the bullet into the chamber each time. It's not automatic. You can't just pull your finger, bang, bang, bang. You got to you got to take that bolt and put it in. So he got all those shots off on his own. How could he possibly have done it? Was it the Russians? Was it the Cubans? Was it the CIA? Uh, was it um, the mob? Those are, those are the main ones, and there's probably more too. But certainly uh, 1963, the height of the Cold War, uh, and uh, we had just had... Uh, the Bay of Pigs incident in Cuba, where we funded some uh, counter-revolutionaries to go back into Cuba to take over the country from Castro. And now this is the Cubans getting back at us. Possibly it's the Russians. Again, uh, mafia, all that, CIA, whatever. Uh, uh, so there's a lot of that going on. And it was pretty much done by 1990. And here Oliver Stone comes in. He makes his... Uh, film asking all these questions all over again, pointing up inconsistencies in this report. That the report that they refer to uh, in the film, and it was fairly uh, fairly well known, was called the Warren Commission report. And after Kennedy was assassinated, the new president Lyndon Johnson put together a blue ribbon panel uh, headed by. Uh, the Supreme Court Justice Earl Warren, and they got the head of the FBI and the head of this and that and the other and outside people and so on, and they put out this, they researched and investigated for a year or so, maybe two, and put out this commission report, uh, hundreds of pages, maybe even a thousand pages, so they're going to refer to the Warren Commission, the Warren Commission, all throughout this film. And that's what they're referring to, this blue ribbon panel headed by uh, Earl Warren. So uh, uh, check that out. This would be a good time, really, just to stop uh, this part, stop me, and go over to the link and check out the links that I have uh, for JFK. And, uh, and it's a pretty, uh, pretty good one. Or you can wait till we're done with Oliver Stone. We have a couple more. Uh, movies to talk about. Uh, he also uh, did the very controversial Natural Born Killers, and it's uh, uh, very violent, and a lot of people are just thinking that it's violence, and it, it, to me it reminds me a lot of A Clockwork Orange, where it looks like some uh, murderous types are having a good time and, and, uh, and uh, uh, sex and violence and, 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 uh, and music and uh, there's little bits of animation, all sorts of stuff floating through there. And he's glorifying violence, just like people said that uh, Kubrick was doing, glorifying violence. But really, when you look underneath, 
uh, Kubrick was talking about free will, and Oliver Stone is doing a satire on media and fame and how these two serial killers are on the cover of magazines and they're, uh, they're on the news and they're on TV shows and all of that. And that's, uh, uh, that's the, the, the uh, deeper message for natural born killers. So Oliver Stone also did uh, Nixon about the president, President Nixon, 1960s, uh, Any Given Sunday about professional football, Savages about uh, drugs uh, uh, crossing the border north and south between the U.S. and Mexico, Mexican drug lords, things like that, and Snowden about the uh, NSA uh, young, young man that leaked all of those documents. So all pretty uh, controversial stuff, and there are a few other films uh, as well. Um, a, a number of them deal with the 1960s, uh, the, the Vietnam War films like Platoon and Born on the Fourth of July, and, and there's another one. Um, and then The Doors, also about the 1960s with, uh, with Jim Morrison and The Doors and, and drugs and sex and all that kind of stuff. So uh, Oliver Stone uh, came, I'm, I'm sort of going back here, looping back around for Oliver Stone. He came from a pretty, well, pretty good family, upper middle class. And during the Vietnam War, most young men who, who were from upper middle class type families who didn't want to go to Vietnam could find a way out, either go to college, uh, which was probably the most popular way, but that was good for about four years or so. You had to be a full-time student. Uh, if you were from a really good family, you could probably find a doctor who could find a, uh, something to uh, keep you out. A number of our uh, presidents, current and former, found uh, doctors and things and, and, uh, and uh, uh, bone spurs and asthma and various ways to uh, stay out of, uh, of the Vietnam War. But Oliver Stone, he volunteered and he went in and um, saw combat. He, he wasn't just, uh, you know, in the background being a, being a uh, uh, photographer or a, or a newspaper or something like that. He was right in there. He was right in, in, in the platoons, in the jungle, all that. He got a lot of um, material for a number of films uh, that he did. The two Vietnam War films in particular, Platoon and Born on the Fourth of July. Uh, another one set uh, peripherally to Vietnam about a young Vietnamese girl and her voyage to America and Orange County. Um, and like I said, and then the, the Doors from the 60s and Nixon from the 60s um, and JFK peripherally about the 60s because it's mostly set in this investigation taking place in the 70s and 80s. Okay, so check out Oliver Stone, uh, Natural Born Killers, and the, the fictitious uh, television uh, documentary, American Maniacs, and then come back and we will dive into Tim Burton. So Tim Burton, one of the directors that most of my students know before taking uh, the, the, this class or any of my classes. There are a few, um, if you're not a real film fan, I have plenty of students who know plenty of directors, but uh, oftentimes I get students who are taking these classes for general ed. They're not, they're not uh, big film fans. They know a few, they know Quentin Tarantino uh, and they know Tim Burton and not too many other directors, really. Um, and uh, so Tim Burton is one of those directors that is generally known by most of my students. Maybe not all of them, but generally known by most of my students. Uh, Tim Burton from Southern California, grew up in Burbank. Uh, big fan of old horror films, uh, going back to Dracula and Frankenstein and things like that and the wonderful films that were made in... Uh, Great Britain in the 1950s and 1960s. So a lot of that, uh, a lot of that stuff seeps in to his films and and uh, the subject matter and some of the actors uh, that were uh, in in those films. 
Uh, he brings him in to be in his films as well. And there he is with Johnny Depp in Edward Scissorhands. They have worked together nine times by my count. I don't know if I'm missing anything or not, but nine times. And uh, with composer Danny Elfman, 19 and counting. And uh, I'm a big fan of both of these uh, men. Uh, Johnny Depp, I think, is a lot of fun, always fun to watch. And Danny Elfman was the uh, front for the band Boingo Boingo, and I was a big Boingo fan back in the day, and I always saw them at their Halloween show down at the uh, uh, down at Irvine Meadows. Um, and so he left rock and roll, got into composing, and you, everybody knows Danny Elfman because he did the theme to The Simpsons, among lots of other stuff, but mostly he's working on future films. Johnny and Tim got together very luckily because they both kind of needed each other. And by that, I mean uh, very much in the same way that Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro uh, really needed each other. Uh, both directors, Scorsese and Burton, were young, just starting out, really trying to make their mark in the world. And you really need uh, people to help you uh, visualize uh, or help you realize your vision. And uh, Scorsese really needed Robert De Niro. He had, he had some good stuff, but if in, in the hands of a mediocre actor, no matter how good of a director you are and so on, you, it's, you're just not going to get noticed. And the same thing for Tim Burton. He had these odd, quirky films that he wanted to make, and he really needed an actor who could help pull that off. And Johnny Depp was on television, uh, 21 Jump Street, uh, playing a cop, uh, a young 20-something-year-old cop who um, goes underground in high schools and colleges and things like that. And he wanted to start making feature films, and uh, he didn't want to just be uh, the young romantic lead. Johnny's a really good-looking guy, uh, just like Brad Pitt and, and, uh, and Matt Damon and Leonardo DiCaprio and, and none of those uh, guys wanted to be a pretty boy, right? They, none of them wanted to be the one that was just, uh, you know, the romantic lead. Um, and women have this uh, same problem even more so. Uh, it's society, it's Hollywood, but women age out of that sort of thing very, very fast. If you are known for your beauty, by the time you get 30 or 35, a lot of those roles are going to go away. And so uh, the smart actors and actresses want to do a little bit more than just being the, the, uh, the love interest. Um, for women, there's a bit more of a double standard. A lot of those men that I just mentioned, Johnny and, uh, and uh, Matt and people like that, they're like, in, Johnny's in his 50s, uh, Brad Pitt's in his 50s. Uh, Leo's in his late 30s, maybe early 40s, Matt Damon's in his 40s, and yet they still get to play the romantic lead. But most women uh, in their 40s and 50s um, have a much harder time. I won't say it's impossible, but they have a much harder time playing the romantic, uh, the romantic lead. And that is a double standard. Double standard. We've been talking about double standard for a while. We'll probably come back, circle around back on it again, but uh, seeing Johnny... Uh, right there, I thought I'd uh, thought I'd bring it up. So, uh, uh, some more Tim Burton films: Beetlejuice, uh, Batman. Be Beetlejuice is the one that kind of helped him get noticed. Uh, before that, his first film was actually Pee Wee's Big Adventure, uh, based on Pee Wee Herman and his his uh, kids show. Uh, most people were thinking about it being a Pee Wee Herman film. But Tim Burton was a really good choice uh, for that film. He does have a, a, a very uh, distinct look, I think, in large part because he studied animation. At uh, he studied at Cal Arts. Uh, that's the that's the uh, college that the Disney family helped found. They wanted a a conduit of good top notch animators that they could bring into to at Disney. Uh, you you. You don't have to work at Disney, of course. Um, 
uh, after CalArts, but they wanted a school that could really uh, that could really uh, take young people and uh, up their animation game, starting with uh, uh, ink and paint and all that, and certainly getting into uh, 3D Pixar uh, type animation, all that. So uh, Edward Scissorhands is uh, one of the films I wanted to to, uh, to uh, hone in on. Uh, early, early work with both Tim and Johnny. It has a framing device. We always mention when any of our films have a framing device. It's sort of rare in movies, and anything that's rare in movies I like to highlight. Of course, in this class, it's not so rare. <laughs> I tend to focus in on, on uh, you know, um, uh, interesting narrative uh, uh, interesting narrative devices and things like that. So uh, this film does have a framing device uh, beginning somewhere in what may or may not be the present. And we see a uh, old lady, grandma, uh, reading a bedtime story to her, I assume, granddaughter. Um, and uh, the grandma is played by Winona Ryder under a lot of makeup. And she's going to tell the story of Edward Scissorhands. Interestingly, we're going to go way back in time. If the, if the grandmother looks to be 75 or 80, then we'd have to be going back about 50 years or so. But when we go back 50 years, it looks like the 1990s. So it's just, um, it's just uh, movie, movie magic, uh, um, what you get to do, right? When you make movies, everything doesn't have to make sense. And uh, this, this time long, long ago when Winona Ryder was a high school student uh, looks very much like 1990 when the movie was made. And uh, has a very interesting look. Tim uh, was from Burbank and he lived in, uh, in those sorts of housing developments and things where so many of the houses are all lined up the streets all kind of look similar, and so when we see this fictitious town where uh, Edward and Winona Ryder's character uh, are, uh, all of the houses look very much alike. They all have a pastel color, uh, could be mint green, could be peach, uh, some kind of yellow, something like that, green grass, blue sky, very colorful. Uh, and you can really see the animation side of uh, uh, Tim Burton. He's, he he's plays a big part in the design of his movies. He does lots of sketches and things for the uh, makeup people and for the costume people and so on. Uh, I Very sadly, I missed a Tim Burton show at our county museum, and I really wish I had gone to that because uh, lots of really great... Lots of really great art, uh, and so on. One of my students showed me a a big, beautiful hardcover book that uh, she got from that show, and um, it's a sort of fine art book you want to put on white gloves or something when you turn the pages. Very beautiful book. I did catch the Kubrick um, the Kubrick show at the County Museum, so that was that was good. Anyway, back to Edward Scissorhands. Uh, we have uh, the framing device with uh, with uh, what went on a rider, and we have the wonderful color scheme, the the neighborhood down below the. Uh, it's not quite a mountain, but uh, there's a castle high up on a hill, and that's where the the I guess mad scientist is, who's going to create life in a lab. And that whole world up there is stone and, and weathered wood and very monochromatic. There's hardly any color at all up there. Edward Scissorhands is all, always in black and white or gray, even when he comes down uh, to the, to the uh, suburbia below. He's wearing, gray, he's wearing gray pants and a white shirt over his black leather um, outfit that he that he's in. So we have that right. We have the color, uh, the color scheme, and all that. And we have a fish out of water. He is a strange creature. 
and we can get the fish out of water, uh, or we do get the fish out of water theme in movies quite a lot. A anytime somebody goes somewhere where, where they are not at home, and it could be just leaving the country for the city, leaving the city for the country, going to Europe, it could be um, uh, could be uh, going really anywhere in the world on vacation uh, somehow. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, the Hangover Part Two, where they go off to, to Thailand, uh, even uh, with uh, with Avatar leaving Earth and going to this strange uh, world. So it's a great theme. It's uh, used a lot. We sort of see this new world, whether it's the city or the country or Europe or Africa or whatever through the eyes of the protagonist. Uh, even, uh, I'm even thinking of National Lampoon's European Vacation, okay? There's lots of these fish-out-of-water themed movies. Here we're going to kind of see suburbia through uh, Edward's eyes, uh, almost like an anthropologist. Oh, look at the strange rituals they have, the backyard barbecue. And it's kind of fun to look at this stuff kind of... At, uh, from a distance, from a distance. We, we live in these suburban uh, neighborhoods, many of us, uh, in modern day America, but it's interesting to look at uh, modern day suburban America uh, kind of as an outsider or as an anthropologist or something like that. And that's one of the things that the fish out of water theme allows us to do. Okay, so uh, Edward is the creation of a I hate to call him a mad scientist. He looks pretty sane, but usually they're called mad scientists. And this, we've talked about this uh, back when we talked about the stages of the genre film. We get the, the revisionist type films, uh, like Frankenstein films. In, in Frankenstein, and Bride of Frankenstein, of course, Dr. Frankenstein was uh, creating life in a lab, electricity and all that strange stuff. And I always have to remind everybody that Frankenstein is the doctor and his creation is the creature or the monster. And uh, so it's Dr. Frankenstein and his monster. Anyway, uh, today we would get, um, not exactly sure what Edward is, uh, oftentimes we would have uh, robots or replicants or androids or cyborgs, whatever you want to call them. I think they're all kind of part and parcel. Um, I guess androids have, I, I, I guess cyborgs and androids have flesh or something or replicants and robots are all metal. I, I'm not really sure. Uh, I love sci-fi, but I'm not really sure what the difference is. But we get uh, Blade Runner and there is Rachel uh, to the right there and we get Westworld on HBO and we get these wonderful sci-fi themes that sci-fi writers love to bring up. Lots of philosophy in sci-fi. I remember it's really good for allegory, if you remember 1984 and things like that. And so do these creations, do these creatures, do they have a soul? Uh, are they killed or murdered in Blade Runner? They are retired. Um, are there are these scientists playing God, creating life, doing something that, that only God should be able to do? Are the android replicant androids slaves? Okay, so all this stuff is brought up. Not, not too much in Edward Scissorhands, but definitely in Blade Runner and Westworld. So, food for thought. Food for thought. All right, back to Tim and Johnny. Um, Ed Wood is based on a real-life person, uh, Edward D. Wood Jr. He was a horror director, and he was known for being particularly awful. And there was a book that came out back, I think, in the 1980s or so, called the Golden, I think it was the Golden Turkey Awards, or the 50 Worst Movies of All Time, I think it was. And uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space was ranked... I guess number one or number 50 or however you want to do it. And that was made by Ed Wood. And it made him sort of famous. There are lots of really bad movies out there. A lot of people know The Room, um, but there are lots and lots of really, really bad movies out there. I guess it's kind of fun to, uh, you know, make fun. Uh, most of us don't even make movies, and these guys managed to at least make a movie, no matter how bad it is. 
so that made Ed Wood kind of famous, I guess, and Tim Burton uh, became a fan. If you are interested, the entire Plan 9 from Outer Space is right there on YouTube for free. So you can watch the whole movie if you want. I've linked uh, to it. I think I've linked to it. It's there. Uh, and um, Or at least the trailer. I guess if you want to watch the whole movie, you, you can do that. And the trailer looks so much like the stuff that Tim Burton shot for his movie within a movie uh, with Ed Wood making Plan 9 from Outer Space. It's really uh, shot for shot and makeup and all that stuff. It's, it's wonderful stuff. Uh, and Ed Wood had a uh, uh, very interesting, he, he, he loved these old guys just like, uh, just like Tim Burton does. And um, so he ran into, literally became friends with Bela Lugosi. And Bela Lugosi was the guy that played Dracula in the 1931 classic horror movie. Uh, here we are uh, right here with, uh, with, uh, with the, the, the Bela Lugosi and the film. And uh, I think this is Vampira. She was a 1950s uh, L.A. TV hostess uh, and Saturday Night at Midnight showing uh, horror movies. That was rather common around, uh, around the country. Uh, Universal, a lot of other studios too, Universal started uh, uh, releasing their movies in uh, packages that television could pick up and rent. And uh, I think we've talked about this a little bit before, maybe not, but television really resurrected a lot of old movies. And cartoons and all sorts of stuff. Um, all those Bugs Bunny cartoons, they were made for movie theaters. They would have just kind of gone away if it weren't for television. And uh, also uh, various serials uh, got resurrected on television. And all of these wonderful horror films. They started appearing on TV in the late 50s. Universal sold a whole package to television. And it it brought them, uh, you know, uh, brought them out of the dusty storage where they were, and people got to rediscover these wonderful movies from the 1930s, uh, 20, 25, 30 years later. So if, if it weren't for television, a, a lot of a lot of early movies, and all those great movies, they kind of would have been lost or forgotten. Then, of course, after television, uh, staying along with home video, we get uh, VHS. And, uh, and DVDs and streaming and all that. But uh, TV, just regular old TV, really saved a lot of this stuff from, uh, from the dustbins of history. So this movie is in black and white, and there are some pretty good directors and some pretty good movies made in black and white. I wanted to, I wanted to call attention to that. Um, there's a there's a few uh, of these groupings that I like to call attention to the the directors who worked in black and white the directors who have worked in in stop motion animation and Tim Burton is in that club as well and um, I think I've got another grouping of actors who became directors with people like Clint Eastwood and Robert Redford and uh, and people like that Jodie Foster people like that so this is the this is the directors who have worked in black and white, modern directors, all the directors in the, in the 30s and 40s worked in black and white, and many in, uh, in the 19, uh, 1950s and 60s. I don't have Stanley Kubrick uh, because 1964, Dr. Strangelove, that, that was still a period when a lot of people were working in black and white. It, was, it wasn't quite 100% color until the late 60s. So, um, yeah, there we go. Modern directors working in black and white. Back to Tim Burton. A few more films you've probably heard of. Mars Attacks, which is a lot of fun. It's very goofy. It's actually based on a bubblegum trading card, just like baseball trading cards, but there was a Mars Attacks series of trading cards. Uh, Sleepy Hollow, based on the... Uh, American story there from uh, the early, early days. 
Revolutionary War days, all that way back when. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory remake, uh, Big Fish, Sweeney Todd, Alice in Wonderland, Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, and Dumbo. Uh, so you can watch Dumbo. Maybe you didn't know it was a Tim Burton movie. You might check that out as well. And the last time I checked the Internet Movie Database, it had a listing for Beetlejuice 2. And I don't know what the status of that is. I would be very excited to see Beetlejuice 2. The original Beetlejuice is a really fun movie. And um, Michael Keaton uh, as Beetlejuice and uh, uh, Alec Baldwin and, uh, and Winona Ryder. So um, good film. I'd love to see that as, uh, uh, I guess... Uh, not really. I guess a sequel. I guess a sequel is what it would be. So, uh, Tim Burton has also worked in stop motion. And when we get up, I think when we get up to Wes Anderson, I will list the other directors who have worked in stop motion. But Tim has three under his belt. And again, I think this dates to his love of animation. And he didn't uh, do animation. I don't think he did stop motion. He did animation. I don't think he did stop motion at Cal Arts, but uh, he has a love of all of that and ghoulish things. The Nightmare Before Christmas, Corpse Bride, Frank and Weenie, very much uh, in uh, the Tim Burton wheelhouse about uh, uh, resurrections and things like that. Uh, Frank and Weenie, uh, about a dog that is resurrected from the dead. Uh, I love the dog's name too, Sparky. Okay, so uh, uh, paying uh, much homage to the Frankenstein movies. And I've linked to uh, the Nightmare Before Christmas trailer, but all three of these movies are really a lot of fun. So um, check those out too, right? You can watch any of those movies for any of your papers. If, you, if you're into animation, that sort of thing, then that's fine too. Next up. Paul Thomas Anderson, known Pete, known as mostly P.T. Anderson, and he's known for moving his camera and long takes and big casts. Um, this is a, a pretty, uh, pretty good cast here. We see Mark Wahlberg and uh, lots of uh, future uh, Oscar winners and Oscar nominees and uh, and so on. Uh, so um, this is Boogie Nights. It has all that, it has all that, big cast and all that. And it is about the adult film industry. It, it's an R-rated movie, so don't, don't worry about that. Uh, but it is set in the 1970s during, uh, during the, the boogie era, <laughs> Saturday Night Fever era. And we have a, at least two really nice scenes of long uh, tracking shots, oneers they're called by some people. Usually it's a, uh, usually somebody with a steady cam following uh, the action. And the movie opens up that way in a, uh, at a disco. And then there's a wonderful scene at a backyard pool party with most of these people and even more. Uh, and uh, we, the camera sort of wanders around and, and the, the point is that us in the audience feel like we're there. We're walking into the nightclub and we're looking around and seeing these people and saying hi to everybody. And when we're at the pool party, it's kind of the same thing, just sort of wandering around and uh, seeing people swimming and talking and drinking and, and uh, all of that. And uh, so I think the steady cam and uh, the long tracking shot takes uh, really does that for us. Martin Scorsese likes to do this sort of thing, too. We might talk about uh, him. And later on, uh, we will talk about two films that appear to not have any edits in them whatsoever, uh, Birdman and 1917. So those movies are both on the horizon. In the meantime, check out the scenes that I have for you on Boogie Nights. It's a real fun film. Uh, uh, P.T. Anderson's second film, second or third film. There's a list. Magnolia, Punch Drunk Love, There Will Be Blood, The Master, Inherent Vice, The Phantom Thread. And um, one of the things that I uh, like 
or one of the things I tried to, to impress in this class is that we talk about directors a lot. And we talk about the movies and some of their best movies and things, but it's a very director-centric class, very auteur-driven. And sometimes it's interesting to see that, oh, the director of that film that I like also directed these other films. Maybe I'll check those out as well. So when we see one Martin Scorsese film or a Tim Burton film or a P.T. Anderson film or a Wes Anderson film, two Andersons, sorry about that, but two Andersons, then I hope that you will be interested in tracking down other films, even though that might not be your favorite genre. It might be a Western, who knows what it will be, but if it's by a director that you like, then I hope you'll check it out. I, that's really how I how I watch movies. I mean, I, yeah, I see certain genres and things that I like, but I will see something that I never would think I would like if it's by a director that I'm interested in. So uh, that's one of the things I hope I hope you get out of this out of this uh, class and this discussion. Okay, next up, two of my very favorites. Boy, I just love these guys. I love their sense of, of, of humor and uh, the way they go about things. Um, there's, a, there's a great line right there, stupid people doing stupid things that describes so many of their movies. And uh, I, I like their sense of humor. It's, uh, it's not exactly slapstick. It's not exactly dry or verbal. I don't know what it is, but I love the Coen Brothers uh, sense of humor, regional, dry, fast talking, and most everything about the Coen brothers I uh, have found in The Big Lebowski. So they've won Oscars and things for other movies, uh, Fargo for screenplay, and uh, there, um, not there will be, um, oh gee, I'm drawing a blank here. How could I, how could that be? Um, and I have to skip to it. No Country for Old Men. <laughs> I'm going too fast. I'm going a mile. I'm going a mile a minute here. Okay. Uh, no Country for Old Men. Best Picture. Uh, best Directors. Best Screenplay. So they won three Oscars for that one. Uh, a little bit of a darker, uh, a darker film. There's bits of humor in all their movies, I think. But uh, definitely violence. Uh, even though they tend to make rather funny films. Uh, there's always violence in them. Um, inside Lewin Davis, there's just a punch in the nose, I guess. There's not a whole lot of violence, but other movies, even their comedies, uh, like The Big Lebowski or Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Um, some kind of some kind of violence. And very importantly, they produce and they direct and they write and they edit their films. And if you look at the credits, they're names, uh, maybe they thought that was too much. So uh, there's a, uh, uh, somebody else is always listed, they always list Roderick Janes as their editor, but that's them. And uh, they have Final Cut, and that's a really big deal. A lot of directors want that. It's, it's, a, it's a real sign of confidence and respect that the studios, who are spending millions of dollars on these movies can give a director. And if you can earn it, like I'm sure Steven Spielberg and, and, and Scorsese and people like that, it's a real big deal. Um, sometimes you can say, well, this movie has to be three hours long. I'm sorry, but this is a three hour long movie. Studios do not like three hour long movies. They like to be able to get as many showings in per day in the theaters as they can. But if you're Martin Scorsese and uh, the Wolf of Wall Street is a three-hour movie, then you have final cut, and you get to do that. So uh, Coen Brothers don't usually go long like that, but if, uh, if you negotiate that, then you can say, you know, this movie is going to need to be R, it's going to need to be this long, and I have the final say. And it's a pretty big deal. Um, you don't want to abuse that. You don't want to push the envelope and say, my contract says I can make... Uh, you know, an NC-17 rated four-hour movie. You really don't want to push that too far or it'll be the last time you get uh, to negotiate for a final cut. But if you're responsible 
and uh, so on, then, then you get Final Cut. And uh, the Coen brothers, and, and like I mentioned, those other directors, a lot of the directors in this class, frankly, have, have Final Cut. I'm sure Christopher Nolan has Final Cut, a lot of those people. And um, the other thing about, uh, uh, about the Coen brothers, and I group them in specifically with uh, Clint Eastwood and Woody Allen in that they make movies quite fast, quite fast, uh, every maybe year and a half or so. And that's, that's pretty fast. And they keep their budgets quite low, quite low, uh, like $30 million, maybe 10, maybe between 10 and 30, which is, believe it or not, a low budget Hollywood movie with all of these big giant franchise movies, whether it's a James Bond movie or a Fast and Furious movie or an Avengers movie, uh, upwards of 250 to 300 million dollars, then a 30 million dollar movie is like, um, hey buddy, can you lend me a 20? Okay, it, it seems like, sure, what the heck, here, I, I, can, I can fund that movie uh, with my credit card and my wallet. So studios love these guys, they all win lots of awards, uh, Woody and Clint and Joel and Ethan, they all win lots of awards, they keep their budget low, and, uh, and the studios like that, right? The studios really, really like that. Now, it's not a big, uh, it's not a big gamble. Right? The studios would love to make a $200 million movie that makes a billion. Okay, they love that. They love that even more. But um, Oscars and things like that are also uh, on the list of things that studios like to, like to get. So The Big Lebowski, it has a film noir plot believe it or not. And there's the dude right here, Jeff Bridges as the dude. And uh, it is a cult hit, very much a cult hit. Uh, there are Big Lebowski uh, fan clubs, Big Lebowski bowling tournaments, where people dress up like characters in the Big Lebowski uh, and, and, uh, and drink his favorite drink, which is a white Russian. <laughs> What is it? Vodka and uh, Kahlua and cream um, and um, and uh, and he he's a pothead. OK, so uh, anyway, it is their most beloved film. Yes, they won Oscars for uh, Fargo and No Country for Old Men and other things like that. But this is really the one that everybody loves. And I guess I got this online here. How often are people dropping the F-bomb or dude or whatever. Uh, but there they are uh, at, the, uh, at the bowling alley where some key scenes are set and we get the, the, the um, uh, repeated uh, dialogue and things like that and, uh, and so on. And I've linked as close as I can. Uh, the downside of, of, of being all the way online is I don't quite have total command of what scenes are shown. YouTube is so fantastic. They have just about everything I want, but sometimes they don't run quite as long as I might like. And normally I would just show about the first 20 minutes or 25 minutes of The Big Lebowski. And I can't quite do it with YouTube, but I think I've uh, got the scenes in the right order. Um, yeah, I think I've got them in the right order, and you kind of get that feel uh, for The Big Lebowski. If you like The Big Lebowski, uh, I would recommend Oh Brother, Where Art Thou as another uh, really good one in that sort of that same vein. And also uh, Hail Caesar is their most recent feature-length film. Um, the Ballad of Buster Scruggs is a... Uh, an anthology. It's six different stories, and that one appeared on Netflix. There we go. Uh, so there we go. No Country, Oscar, Writing, Directing, and Best Picture. That's kind of their their big one there. But uh, like I say, their their beloved uh, their beloved movies would be Fargo. Everybody loves Fargo, and and uh, definitely Big Lebowski and Oh Brother. So, um, and, and 
for me, uh, Hail Caesar kind of fits in there quite nicely, I think. And a lot of them you can track down. They're, they're there, they're, they're streaming, Hulu, Netflix, Amazon, whatever. They're not hard to track these down, so you might enjoy a, uh, enjoy a Coen Brothers film for your next paper or just 